Okay, so the next topic is sampling. And I will present you with kind of, I'll call it Jason's naive sampling theorem. And you might think that if you have a cosine and you want to sample it, maybe you need to sample something like 10, 10 times as fast as the cosine is going in order to fully reconstruct the waveform. Uh, but that's, that's not actually true. The Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, which is the actual sampling theorem, says that if a signal contains frequencies less than some maximum frequency, you can perfectly reconstruct it by sampling at only twice that maximum frequency or faster. So let me kind of motivate maybe why, where that factor of two comes from. So why do you need to sample at least twice as fast as the maximum frequency in your signal? So if you imagine a, a cosine here, what the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem is saying is that if you sample at the top and at the bottom and at the top and at the bottom, that's sufficient to perfectly reconstruct, to have enough information to perfectly reconstruct the signal. That seems a little, uh, a little counterintuitive and, and quite impressive because there's all this stuff in between that you have to interpolate properly. Um, maybe an obvious question is what, if you happen to sample here and here and here at the zero crossings, um, you would think that nothing is going on. But uh, this explains why I said less than rather than less than or equal to. You need to sample a little bit faster than catching every maximum and minimum. Um, and let me ask the question, what happens if you go too slow? So if you sample too slowly and say maybe you sample here and then you sample over here and maybe you sample over here, if I were to connect these points, it looks like a signal of much lower frequency. And this effect where you, you sample too slow and you get a really uh, slow signal, this is called aliasing. And it's called aliasing because frequencies that should have some high name end up showing up as frequencies which have a low name. They, they, uh, uh, they, they show up as, as low frequencies that don't actually exist in your original signal. And so I think that new radio is a great way to show some of this stuff. And so let me just start a flow graph and demonstrate a couple of these things pretty quickly. And we'll learn a little bit about uh, how to do some, some simulations and some visualizations in new radio. I'll make a new flow graph and this will be all simulation. So I'm just gonna call this sampling, sampling and uh, my sample rate. I'll do my usual one megahertz for ease of math. And let me save this as sampling. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put down a signal source. So control F, signal source, waveform generator signal source. And I will do everything with real numbers and the homework will be to do a few of these things with, with complex numbers. So I'm gonna change this to floating point, real numbers. And uh, sample rate looks good. Waveform cosine, uh, that's fine. This is an actual, gonna be an actual cosine when I choose this to be float. Let me call this frequency. Let me make this adjustable. So let me call this frequency, frequency in kilohertz times a thousand. And let me, let me make a range, a slider, QT GUI range over here, um, where I, define that frequency frequency in kilohertz. And uh, let's say that the default value, I'll make this 20 kilohertz, and this will go all the way from zero up to maybe 1.5 1. 1. kilohertz, 1.5 E3. Okay, so now I have a signal source that outputs a cosine. Uh, since this is a simulation, I have no real hardware, I need to throttle block, and I will do that. Fortunately, since everything is real, I have to change the type to be real. That's fine, I can throttle it at one megahertz. That's what we want. And now, as always, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at it. So QT GUI time sync, time sync and frequency sync. Uh, 
Okay, now both of these need to be um, both of these need to be real. I'm going to change them to float, and I'm going to have a lot of these. So I'm going to actually bother to give some of these some some names here. So first of all, my number of points for the time sink. I'm going to set that to be 50. I'm going to show just a few points. Uh, my sample rate is is at sample rate, and in my configuration here, I'm going to change my, my label to be just source. So I'm just gonna look at right what's coming out of the source. Uh, and that looks good. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on my markers. So under label one marker, I'm gonna turn those into circles. And now that it's orange real, I can connect it. And similarly with frequency sync, I'm gonna set that to be float. Sample rate, that looks good. Uh, I'm gonna configure this and give this the name source and connect it. Okay, let me play. And here I have samples of a real signal and I can change that to give myself more and more and more and more samples. And by default, the time sync connects these with straight lines. And you might think that as, as I go up in frequency, this does not look all that great, right? By connecting these with straight lines, I get some pretty, pretty weird looking waveforms, but the frequency plot really does think I have a single peak at whatever frequency I've set, uh, in addition to some extremely low level rounding noise here. So again, this is in decibels. So you know, we're talking uh, 10 orders of magnitude down from, from the peak, but Naively, it, it, the sampling theorem doesn't, doesn't look like we're doing so great here because if we're sampling at a megahertz, the sampling theorem says we can go up to almost 500 kilohertz and still be fine. And if you notice by default, 500 kilohertz is the edge of this frequency plot. So let's actually do that. Let's go up, 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 up. And if we hit 500 kilohertz exactly, we see that we exactly have this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down sampling here. Um, and, and the peak has, has gone all the way up to the very maximum. And because it's a real cosine, everything is symmetric. If we were to break it up into complex exponentials, there's just as much e to the i omega t as there is e to the minus i omega t. And let's see what happens if I go beyond 500 kilohertz. If I sample, if I go too fast, I start to skip peaks and troughs. And again, things look wonky, but if you look at the frequency plot, things are sliding back down. And if I go really far to be you know, almost twice as much, this should be at a frequency that's way faster than these samples. But in reality, what I'm getting is I'm getting a wave that looks pretty sinusoidal at a pretty low frequency. And so this is pretty bad, this, this aliasing. I'm aliasing really high frequencies uh, down to really low frequencies. Let me show you that the sampling theorem works, at least in simulation. And let me do that in a couple of ways. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show three different versions of this time and frequency. And it's convenient to arrange them uh, in a certain pattern on the screen. And so I'm gonna show you something that we haven't used before which is how to arrange these elements. Normally I just plunk them down and I let them arrange themselves. But um, let me take advantage of this last item here, which exists in all of these called GUI hint. And in this hint, I give the row, the column, and then the number of rows and number of columns that each of these items takes up. Uh, and this is Python, so things start with zero. So my slider, I want it to be in the zeroth row, zeroth column. I want it to take up one row, but I want it to span across two columns. And here I want to arrange these side by side. So my time sync, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to arrange it. Uh, I want this to be one, zero. So it'll be on the, the second row and the zeroth column. But I want it to take up three rows and only one column because I want it to be wider than this range slider. And similarly here, uh, in the GUI hint, I'll have second row, second column. I'll take up three columns 
and one row. So now if I play this, I have the time and the frequency side by side, and my slider is, is on the top, and it's taking up you know, roughly a third of what these boxes are taking up. All right, so I haven't changed anything about the, about the flow graph, but let me show you how I can reconstruct a perfectly smooth sine wave, even from samples that look pretty bad, like, like that. And there are two ways of doing it. I'd say the, one of the ways that a lot of digital to analog converters work is that they just turn the samples into square waves. And this isn't, this isn't the best way, as we'll see, but it's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty simple way. So I can, I can take a repeat, repeat block. And instead of just plotting the symbols, I will turn this into floating point numbers. Now we'll repeat each sample 10 times. And, um, and now I will plot the samples. So I want another QT GUI. I'll pull down another time sink and another frequency sink. And I will turn these both real. Uh, if I want to show the same number of points, I showed 50 points here, but now each point has turned into 10 points. So I should show 500 points here. I should be a little bit careful. If I want the time scale of this plot to be correct, my sample rate has increased by a factor of 10. I've interpolated each point. I've turned it into 10 points. So my sample rate should be a factor of 10. And just to arrange this on the page, I'm going to go with 4, 0, 1, 3. So we're 4. We're on row 4 here because uh, I said that these each take up three rows. And let's see. I'll connect that. So same thing with the frequency sync here. I'll make that float. Uh, I have to change my sample rate to be sample rate times 10 if I want all the numbers to work out, right? And my, I will arrange that next to the other one. So four, one, three, one. Okay, so let's, let's play this and I will show you what the time and frequency spectrum of this uh, of these points look like. Oh, and maybe I want to config and turn on the, uh, I'll call this repeat, repeat, and I'll turn on the marker, the circle marker. I'll call the frequency thing repeat also. Um, repeat. What did I do differently here? Oh, this should be four, zero, three, one. I want it to be three, uh, Three high and one across. Three high and one across. All right, let's try that. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so now you can see that every every sample has been interpolated by just being turned into ten samples. And as I go up in frequency here, we see that we sort of get this stair stepping pattern where each sample has turned into this little stair step pattern. And so far, it doesn't look like we've won everything. We've won anything. You know, at some random frequency, this should be well within my Nyquist sampling theory. But now I have a super weird stair steppy pattern. Uh, what we see, though, is that this stair steppy pattern corresponds to a particular frequency spectrum. Now, since we've interpolated each sample 10 times, our frequency spectrum goes out 10 times as far. So we have our original two spikes, which are these two spikes, and we have all kinds of harmonics of those spikes that are uh, that are uh, at higher frequencies. And and the next step that we're going to do to reconstruct a pretty smooth-looking wave is to filter out all of these harmonics. So let me close that, and let me put a low-pass filter down to filter out all those harmonics. So let me move that up here. Um, we do a low, low pass filter. To filter all those harmonics. I'm going to turn this into a real, real filter. So it takes floating point numbers in, puts floating point numbers out. Um, and my sample rate coming into this filter, remember, is really this times 10. And I want my cutoff frequency to cut off all of those harmonics. And so I'm going to cut off at 500 kilohertz, 
And um, let's see. And I need to pick a transition width. And I would like this to be extremely narrow. I'd like an extremely sharp uh, transition right at uh, right at 500 kilohertz. But computationally, depending on how fast your laptop is, 10 kilohertz is pretty reasonable. Uh, you might be able to bump it down to one kilohertz if you've got a super fast computer. But this is pretty good for demonstration purposes. Uh, and I think that's good enough. So I will put my stair steppy pattern into that low pass filter. And now I will plot that. I think the easiest thing for me to do is actually just to copy these blocks and paste them over here. And I will change a couple things. I will change the position of these. So I'll add three more rows here. So now I'm going to go seven. And I'll change the name. Instead of repeat, uh, I'm going to call this low pass. And same thing here. I will move this down by three positions. And instead of repeat, I'll call it low pass. OK, so now what we see, especially as I increase the frequency, we see this stair steppy pattern. But what has happened is I've used my low pass filter, and I filtered out all of these harmonics. So what I get back is a pretty nice, smooth wave. And I can go faster and faster and faster. And here, the stair steppy pattern is more dramatic, but I'm still keeping just the, the fundamental there. And if I go faster and faster and faster, stair steppy pattern gets pretty weird looking. But I can perfectly reconstruct the sine wave, you know, at least with this factor of 10 sample, uh, by just keeping the these frequencies here. So I can push it pretty far. I can go all the way to uh, 450. So here the stair steppy pattern is looking pretty weird. Um, I can even go, you know, that, that looks super weird, uh, but it reconstructs a pretty nice sine wave. I can go right to 500 here, and I get I get back my my uh, my sine wave here. So this is kind of a a demonstration that the Nyquist sampling theorem actually holds. And one of the ways to reconstruct is to interpolate the signal between samples in some way and then low pass filter. Now, there's one disadvantage of the stair step interpolation. And that is, as you can see, my original signal has a pretty high amplitude. But as I scan this down in frequency, or sorry, as I scan this up in frequency, um, my reconstructed signal is actually losing amplitude. So as I go to lower and lower frequency, you can see that it picks back up again. And so there are two ways of handling that. One way is that in the real world, when a digital to analog converter outputs a stair steppy pattern, um, and then there's a low pass filter, you can tweak the low pass filter to have a, a non-flat frequency response over the range that you actually are passing the signal. So when the, uh, as this thing dies off, you can actually enhance it a little bit at higher frequencies before it cuts off. And that, that is one of the ways that this is dealt with. Another way to do it is to pre-digitally pre filter the, the wave before you pass it to the digital analog converter to get rid of this, this slow roll-off effect. But let me show you kind of the more theoretical way of perfectly reconstructing the, the output wave. And this is maybe what you've, you've learned in some class. So instead of repeating 10 times, I'm going to disable that block. And I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. So instead of taking each sample and just repeating it 10 times, I'm going to take each sample and I'll put a little spike that's proportional to that sample, and then a bunch of zeros. And so to do that, I'm going to pull up this interpolating, interpolating FIR filter. So this is probably the least intuitively named block that we will use. Um, again, I will change its, uh, its type to be real. Um, I will interpolate again by a factor of 10. 
And now we have to tell it what to do with each sample. So when our sample comes in, we'll spit out 10 samples. And those 10 samples will be 10 times the original sample and then a bunch of zeros. So nine zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it'll spit out a big spike that's 10 times as big as the original sample and then a bunch of zeros. Okay, and that will be what we will pass to our time sync and frequency sync and also to our low pass filter. And this is supposed to simulate delta function samples. So a little delta function spikes at every sample instead of square, uh, square stair steps at every sample. And if we play this, I have to zoom out in order to see the, the 10 times as big samples here. But what you see is that there are samples that are following the samples of my original signal, but then there are a bunch of zeros in between. And if I go to higher and higher frequency, we see that there are still these impulses every 10 samples. Um, but what you'll notice is that I can go to quite high frequency here and it never rolls off. It's always amplitude one, even though the actual samples look pretty wonky because they follow this, uh, follow the, the true samples. Um, if you work out the frequency spectrum of this scaled pulse train, uh, you'll you'll see that it is exactly this. It is a uh, it is the the fundamental and a whole bunch of harmonics that move around in the way you've been seeing. And if you filter out all but the fundamental, you can perfectly reconstruct the original signal. And again, these these harmonics are bigger than the harmonics were for the stair step. So these residuals are a little bit bigger. But again, there are still 10, 10 orders of magnitude down from uh, from the the primary here. So it still looks extremely cosine -y. This This idea of sampling and reconstructing is, is what happens uh, in, in the SDR when we transmit. And uh, the architecture of the digital analog converter depends on exactly which transmitter we're using. So that's, that's sampling. And let me give you some homework. And the homework is, is a lot simpler than, than going through all this again. It's to start a new flow graph and just use a complex signal source instead of a real signal source. And show that when you go too fast for, for the Nyquist theorem to hold, when you go more than half the sample rate, uh, what happens is it actually wraps around to the other side. So the frequency will go higher, 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 higher. And uh, there'll only be a single spike because it's a complex exponential. And that's what the frequency sync is plotting. It's plotting the amount of complex exponential at different frequency. And when it reaches the high end of the graph, it actually jumps to the low end of the graph and, and uh, proceeds again. So this is something that we'll see when we take a signal that's not just a single frequency, but has a whole width. If we multiply it by a complex exponential to shift it around, if we shift it so much that it falls off the edge of our samples, it'll actually wrap around and appear back at the beginning. So uh, that flow graph should be pretty simple, but it'll demonstrate this wraparound effect. Let me also point out that every operation we did here to reconstruct the signal was linear. So whether we repeated a sample 10 times, that's a linear operation. If I have a superposition of more than just one cosine, um, and I repeat the samples 10 times, I get the superposition of whatever I would have gotten out. Um, interpolating with this filter, having little spikes that are proportional to each sample, that's also linear. If I have a superposition of stuff coming in, I'll get spikes out. Uh, this low pass filter is designed to be linear. You put in a linear combination of stuff and out, out will come a linear combination of the outputs. And so what that means is that everything we said about signals of particular frequencies applies to superpositions of signals. So instead of having a single cosine at a particular frequency, if I had a more complex signal that was, that was band limited, that had frequencies only up to that frequency of interest, if I were to construct perfectly all frequencies below the cosine I'm showing, that means that whatever superposition of cosines I needed to make up my signal of interest 
would have flowed perfectly well through all this and been perfectly reconstructed at the output.